Hey everybody, it's Allie and welcome to our Y&R chat for Sunday, May 8th, 2016. Happy Mother's Day! It's really weird that Y&R has timed this story about a mother who had her child stolen away from her and was dead before she really got a chance to reunite with the child right in tune with Mother's Day. Was that planned or was that just a, a, a tasteless accident? I, I'm not sure. Um, we talked a lot last week about the tragedy of Sage's life, but this week I really feel like YNR did a good job of focusing in on the tragedy of Nick's life. Nick is someone who has lost a lot too. He has already gone through the pain of losing a child when he lost Cassie. The man has two failed marriages, then lost another child, and lost his wife. And I really felt his pain this week. I think YNR has put a huge spotlight on Josh Morrow, and he's done a phenomenal job. That scene where Nick goes back to the crash site and takes like a tire iron and is just crying and wailing and smashing and beating up that car and cutting his hair and bleeding and and this man comes along and says hey buddy are you okay you're kind of bleeding there and Nick doesn't even hear it he's just in this cloud of smoke standing in the ruins of what is left of his life and it has really rocked Nicholas Newman to his core he's going around town uh, um uh, talking about the Newman curse. I thought that was a, a neat and interesting little writing tidbit there this week as Nick is feeling like everybody in this family is cursed including me and you know just you know we're never happy we're people who have all of this money and all of this power and influence and we're just miserable and he mentioned it on more than one occasion and I thought it really really rang true it's kind of in a way the essence of the young and the restless there are these rich people who should you know have all the money and power in the world and have every reason to probably be happy yet there's this constant tragedy constant drama constant curse that seems to be upon them and really if you look at the Newman family right now it's true there does seem to be this Newman curse and Nick is the one who I think as a result of this shock that he's gone through is is starting to realize it and I think it's also signaling a huge change in his character he really broke down at the funeral which um, I'm gonna I'm gonna resist the urge <laughs> To do, to do my funeral uh, fashion review, which is really hard for me because I, wa I wanted to. Okay, well, you know, Sage worked for Chelsea 2.0. Don't you think she would want me to at least mention a few of the outfits that were trotted out during her service? If I was going to do a best dressed and worst dressed, for me, I thought... <laughs> Despite the fact that her life is in shambles, she is a shell of a woman, Sharon looked phenomenal. I loved the dress with the sheer paneling in the front and the back and she just looked so good at the service. I thought Chelsea looked really nice too and she can, she's got her new haircut. Yes, looking very, very beautiful. I didn't love Summer's dress, so I have to feel like for, for me that was probably the worst dress. It had kind of a lace panel up on top and then it was leather on the bottom or at least it had a, a pleather or a leather appearance it didn't look funeral appropriate it was just weird to me but uh but you know it was it was of course interesting to see how everyone looked and say i think sage would appreciate it because i mean barely it was barely a funeral it was more of i suppose a memorial service they held it outside in the park no church no casket there was one picture of sage sitting on a stand thank goodness that she had a high resolution photo of herself so they could blow it up into one big portrait um it was so it was just not very 
funeral like I didn't love it to be honest with you there was something that felt lacking it didn't feel like it was about sage I had this sort of empty feeling from the funeral a, a feeling like we didn't really know her I mean there is so very little that we did know about her even though she became such a powerhouse on the young and the restless especially there at the end it just made me feel empty like there was so much more to know and we just didn't get that um, I, I think this by the way is gonna be the beginning of seeing the Chancellor Park set for all spring all summer all fall they did a beautiful job um, just little details like the fact that they had fallen leaves on the ground on the pathways I mean I think it is a beautiful set and they've done a really good job with it and I, I noticed that we have a Chancellor Park cafe now so I'm sure we'll be seeing some restaurant outdoor scenes there they had some new signage for the park of course we see Catherine's plaque and maybe that's part of the reason it, it's so hard to watch because you can't be there and not think about Catherine and there was a lot of elements of this week where I couldn't help uh, thinking about Catherine she's everywhere all over the show um, you know whether whether she's actually here or not um, but it was a big week for Sage a big week for Sage fans I suppose and Sage non fans as a matter of fact uh, last week's YRChat.com poll was, did YNR make the right move with Sage's death? And there were a lot of comments. 79% of you said, no way, Sage's time was cut way too short, while 21% said, yes, it was a good plot twist, so goodbye, Sage. And, and I really enjoyed reading the comments so many good ones here on this post um, because a couple people even you know the people that voted the the that they were um, <laughs> that it was a good plot twist sayonara sage even you know went on to kind of explain apparently there was a hashtag sages dead party <laughs> on Twitter or something where people were happy to know that she was gone so I guess I don't know if there's any characters on the show that I would really ever would be happy if they were dead but I thought it was interesting also to hear from the people who were like goodbye uh, you know whether they whether they liked Sage or just liked the plot twist that was interesting to read so thanks for all the comments and the other thing that kind of surprised me in reading the com those comments were several people mentioned throughout the course of the week that they do not ultimately want to see Adam and Chelsea raising Christian once the paternity comes out and I'm I'm kind of surprised by that because I completely assumed that that was what was going to happen, that eventually Adam and Chelsea will raise Christian and that that's what the viewers would want too. But surprisingly to me, a lot of people really feel like they want to see Nick raise the child. So I think that is a really good poll question for this week. When the truth comes out about Christian's paternity, who do you want to see? see raise him are you in the camp of thinking well Adam's the father I want to see Adam raise his son or are you thinking that you would like to see Nick raise Christian because it's it's what Sage wanted so if you'd like to cast your vote on that question why our chat.com is where that poll is I don't know I can kind of see both sides but I kind of feel like more like well it's Adam's son he should raise his son and even though I know that it's going to be devastating for Nick and it has been so hard to watch Nick going through this process at the I guess I'll call it a memorial because it wasn't really a funeral but at the memorial service Nick is trying so hard to hold it together I think realizing himself that he's lost a lot in his life and he begins to 
little by little unravel and start to lash out at the crowd saying, well, I mean, it kind of amounted to, you don't know how I feel. Everybody's here giving me well wishes, saying all of the right things, but nobody really understands what this is like. And in the middle of his incredible grief, who should stand up from the crowd but Sharon? And it's like she opens her, her mouth and says, Nick, you're not alone. And then it, it cuts to the, the end of the show. I, I thought, you know, she's not going to say anything. This is the oldest trick in the soap opera book. She stands up and the audience is supposed to think that she's going to have some big confession. Sharon is the one who has the key. She can make a lot of this grief a little more, to at least to more tolerable for Nick. She can give him a piece of sage, or so she may think. Uh, but, and she, she's, I know that she's not going to do it. I mean, I'm, th I'm thinking, you know, it's like, she almost says is it, says it at the very end of the show, cut to the end of the show, open up on the next show, and of course she backpedals and she starts to come up with some other reason to cover up what she was really going to say. She just continues to lie. And it, it, it's unbelievable to me that she's getting away with it even this far. It seems to me that all through Dylan asking her questions about the night of the crash, Nick asking her questions about the night, Sharon had more than one opportunity this week to tell Nick and she chose not to. Throughout Paul questioning her, throughout the uh, her trying to wriggle out of going to the memorial service, to her at the memorial service, Sharon has this permanent, like, suspicious deer in the headlights look on her face i wish that we could do some kind of con like impression impersonation contest <laughs> to, to everybody do their best impersonation of how sharon looked all week i mean it's just the shiftiest like her eyes are just wide open and she i mean she practically is like looking side to side just uh, oh i mean she's just got this incredibly incredibly suspicious look on her face it's crazy crazy to think that nobody is sitting her down and talking to her and digging a little deeper to find out what the truth is. I'm trying to understand Sharon because my initial reaction is just to be repulsed with her at this point. How can she know this secret? know what Sage wanted and be so disrespectful toward Sage, be so disrespectful toward Nick as to not tell him. And I'm trying to understand because the fact of the matter is, I don't think, at least me, that, uh, that, that Sharon is responsible for what happened. Sharon didn't, uh, for what happened with the baby switch, I mean, Sharon didn't ask to be drugged up, put in a mental institution, and manipulated, and all of a sudden have this baby put into her arms. None of that was on Sharon. And I can even understand when she first found out that she that her instinct was to lie. I can even understand up until that point, but we're getting to the part now where it's so much more devious. And yes, I understand what Sharon's motive is. I really do think that everything Sharon is doing is trying to not cause any pain. And that includes selfishly not wanting to cause any pain for herself. She doesn't want to lose this child who she 100% feels is her child and has believed is her child for months now. And probably, she does. She more importantly, she doesn't want to do that to Dylan. She doesn't want to have to say, um, yeah, you know that kid that you completely think is yours? Yoink, gone now. And oh yeah, by the way, I lied a lot to make this happen. She doesn't want to add any stress to the baby's life. I think that she doesn't necessarily want to rock Nick's world anymore. I think she knows if she opens up about everything that happened, Nick is going to hate her, going to hate her for everything that happened with um, Christian is going to hate her for 
any role that she might have played on the night of Sage's death. And it's just, I, I understand Sharon's motive to lie, but I just think it's better to be honest. You have to be honest and let the chips fall where they may. I mean, it's going to be, it feels like it's going to be this struggle for who is going to end up raising Christian because you know that that truth is going to come out sooner or later. I have this sort of imaginary idea in my mind that it's going to be <laughs> like uh, Dylan. It's going to be like a remake of Three Men and a Baby starring Adam Newman, Nick Newman, and Dylan McAvoy. And they all move in like the, it's a spin-off series from YNR and they all move into some condo and they're trying to raise Christian, all three of them, and maybe you find out toward the end of the series who the, the what the paternity is, who the real father is. Um, that's such a weird poll. Do you guys remember that movie? I want to say it was like, I'm sure that it was Steve Gutenberg and um Tom Selleck, and I want to say it was Ted Danson, but I could be wrong about that. It was like this, it was a huge movie in the 80s and 90s, and now I'm just imagining it uh, recast, maybe it was the 90s, I'm imagining it recast with these three because the struggle is going to be real. I don't think that Dylan is going to fight, though. I think Dylan is probably going to crumple up and die inside. He's going to leave Sharon. How could he possibly stay with Sharon when this truth comes out? So I, I feel like the real battle for who should raise the child and who will raise the child is probably going to be between Nick and Adam. And I, I, I don't know. I don't know when that's going to come out. I was very shocked to see that Sage had a will. I, I, I'm trying to wrap my brain around the fact that she would go out of her way to write this very thoughtful will um, at her age. And it seemed current. It seemed like she maybe wrote it a couple weeks ago uh, and that she would uh, like go, go to the go to the trouble of leaving these little mementos to people. I, I need to, it remi that's another thing that kind of reminded me of Catherine. I need to get on top of writing my will and make sure that I have some haunting um, and heartfelt letters for the people in my life that, that are suggestive maybe. Maybe I'll suggest that I know a secret or something. So I got, I got to get on top of my uh, of my will letter writing uh, <laughs> campaign. Uh, it was, it was I, and I'm also thinking like what does sage even have i was shocked just shocked that there was a will at all um it was of course just an excuse to pull together all of the main guilty players into one room oh and it was just like okay and i guess michael's the executor of her this whole storyline kind of seems thrown together like they just decided to do it at the last minute which i'm, I'm kind of wondering if that's the case if it was sort of a knee jerk because there were so many ways in which it seemed like Weiner was going in a different or going in a certain direction and then all of a sudden Sage is just dead and she has this will and they're just like throwing other pieces of information at us that were like okay I guess out of the blue um but it's weird that she would leave a, a photo of Nick and Victoria to Victoria I had it framed and I want you to have this photo I mean, it's so it, it's so weird it's just self serving and weird. Of course, Sharon's called to the uh, to the will reading. So basically so that we can watch her sit there with her eyes wide open, shifting side to side and looking completely suspicious and probably a little shaky while, while absolutely nobody in the room notices. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure it had to uh, uh, rip her heart out extra as Sage leaves some vintage toy car to Sully because uh, she it was supposed to be for Christian and she knows that it was a gift from Victor and she knows that Sully should have it and you know just wanted to you know that extra uh, pull on Sharon's heart that she ended up doing absolutely nothing about um, I thought it was weird that she left this letter for Nick that was sweet but I why did he have to read it out loud I'm it just it seemed like less personal. I just feel like the whole thing with Sage felt so impersonal and quick 
and she said some really nice things to him and but it, it didn't it didn't sound like sage it didn't hit for me as being for sage it just seemed like it was just one more moment of pain for nick and then bizarrely that they save adam's for your eyes only letter for last and how weird it was that adam would get a for your eyes only letter and nick wouldn't it's 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 just bizarre to me um adam was sweating the whole time thinking that something was up that oh no did sage find out right because because the vo the, the last voicemail the last phone call that Sage had made from her phone was to Adam and she left him a voicemail basically saying I gotta talk to you about Christian and Adam lies to the cops by the way and tells him oh uh, yeah it was nothing she was just trying to get a hold of Chelsea and I deleted it but Adam knows that it was a voicemail about Christian and now he's being summoned to this will so he and Chelsea was actually honest with Chelsea about it surprise surprise they go to the the will reading and they're on pins and needles thinking is sage did she know that i was the father and now she's gonna bust me out and uh, surprisingly th th without the busting out part ended up being true adam and chelsea take this for your eyes only letter home i can't believe nobody else was like that's weird let me read it uh, but they're respecting sage's wishes they go home, they read the letter, and Sage is revealing in this letter to Adam that she knew all along that Adam was Christian's father, which I was shocked. That's something that we as the audience didn't know. And I laughed out loud. I laughed out loud when she's saying, I, re I realized that you must have changed the DNA results. And I was grateful because it's who realizes that? I, if, I, just, I can't imagine figuring out, oh, you know what probably happened was that he changed the DNA test results. That's it's so absurd. That would never enter into my consciousness. This. But the thing that really actually did make sense to me was where she said was the fact that she knew and that she was grateful. I that is one piece of this that I totally believe and I totally buy into because I'm thinking back to the time when Sage had is Sage is the one I think who initiated those test results and I think that Sage always kind of knew in her mind that Adam was the father and when she got the test results nick found out i think that they were at the underground and she received the results and nick comes in and he's like what are those dna test results it's so common around here and he takes them from her and reads them on his own before she even gets a chance to look at them and i'm thinking back about it and i think she completely expected that it was going to be adam i think she even ended up leaving nick or something before she even knew the results so i think she assumed that it was adam and she just was sh shocked when nick says no there it's actually you know this is this is my baby and so she just like went along with it but it makes sense to me that that either immediately or at some point along the way that she would just figure it out and she says in the letter I would look in your eyes and I knew that you felt the same grief that I did over the loss of of Christian and it, it also kind of in retrospect in retrospect makes sense that she was drawn to Adam so much. It sort of explains why she wanted to move in next door, she wanted to spend a lot of time with him, and that there was just a bond there. But I guess my only sort of beef with it is I just wish ultimately that she would have survived. I think it would have been a much more interesting story to find out that she knew all this time and yet she was still here to deal with the consequences and to talk through that and to, and to um, you know, talk to Adam about that one-on-one. -on -one. So I'm totally in for that twist. 
that she knew. I just wish that she would have been able to stick around to, to see how it all played out. But the interesting thing is, in the letter, she says to Adam, and I think this is her real motivation in writing it, it did, she didn't need to tell Adam that she knew. She needed to make sure that Nick was protected. And she asks Adam in the, in the letter, please don't ever tell Nick. All that you would ever do would be to end up hurting him and she didn't want that and Adam seemed to accept that as well as Chelsea and they even you know sort of went back to that voicemail and and where they were asking themselves why would Sage need to talk to us still and Adam says I don't know maybe she found out something else about Christian whatever it is it died with her and they ceremoniously burn the letter in the fireplace, you know, where Adam likes to burn any evidence. I am so over Billy Abbott right now, but I will talk more about that later. I am intrigued by the fact that there's a new man for Victoria Newman. I mean, it's just, it's so, it's so predictable, yet I like seeing Victoria with somebody else, somebody who's maybe a little bit fresh and doesn't have this baggage and maybe it's somewhat innocent too. I can't help thinking that this new bartender guy is basically Billy pre-Dilia's death. He's got all of the same kind of attitudes maybe about life. He's a little bit different. He's a little bit offbeat, um, but he seems a little bit more relaxed yet smart. I, he just gives me a vibe like Billy used to before Delia died and everything changed for him. And of course that wasn't Billy's fault by any means, but there's something a little more innocent and a little bit more fun that I think could be in store for Victoria and this guy and I think she enjoys the fact that he doesn't know her. She's able to have this level of anonymity. He asked her what her name was and she said, my name's Tori. <laughs> I thought that was great. I loved that moment. I loved that he seems to have a little bit of a chip on his shoulder about the 1% and he doesn't know that she's Victoria Newman and she's very much that 1%. So there's just this opportunity for these two people to get to know each each other irrespective of what their stations in life are, how much money they have, what their job is. And I think Victoria is wanting to be known like that. A lot of her relationship with Billy was affected by Victor and was affected by the fact that she was a Newman and he was an Abbott. And now here we have something where none of that comes into play. And I think it will be interesting to see. Um, Luca. The snake <laughs> is wanting to find his inn at Newman Enterprises, and in order to do that, he wants to deceit Victoria from the throne. So he's having her investigated. His investigator has already followed Victoria to the bar and has reported back to him that she's been slumming it. I'm kind of disgusted by Luca at this point. Just on a side note, could his suits get any tighter? Everything he wears, it's like, how do you sit down without busting a seam? What on earth? I mean, you need, I get it, like skinny tie and skinny cuts and all that. I get what you're going for, but it's too tight. <laughs> He's hot, okay, and I like the body yaddy yaddy, but I, I don't like seeing a man walking around like he, he just, like it's in skin tight clothes. It's not flattering, I don't think. Maybe it's just me. Um, but he is totally snaking around and Summer finds out that he went to go see Victor, yada yada, and it's just gross the way that he lies to her and is it's starting to become clear that he's manipulating Summer. Do I think that he actually has feelings for her? Probably. I think that he does like Summer. I think he does have a connection with her, but I think he's using her too. And it's starting to come to light. And he, the way he 
manipulates her when she asks questions is really shady. She confronts him about, you know, what are you doing? You're, you're going to see my grandfather. None of this really involves you. Why are you doing this? And he comes up with ex excuse about how he wants to be respected as part of your family. I'm doing this for you, for us. And that's what leaves a bad taste in my mouth when it comes to Luca. He's really, really up to something and I'm kind of wondering if he's going to find some kind of information that will disgrace Victoria in some way. And I don't think it'll necessarily be related to the bartender guy whose name I need to learn, sorry. <laughs> um, but I'm wondering if there's something in her past that he'll be able to dig up out of nowhere and maybe he will be successful in de dethroning her. I'm kind of wondering if we're slowly seeing the Victor's life without Victor Newman fantasy. You remember that single episode where it was what happened if Victor was not ever in the picture? What would everybody's life look like? I'm kind of wondering if that is coming true little by little. I mean, look at it. Nikki's a drunk. Nick, uh, I think, I think the thing is, Victoria is going to end up sort of like that character where, or it's possible, where she's not working at Newman Enterprises and she's just kind of lost and just sort of looking for love, which was represented between her and Luca in the dream. But Nick is the really, really interesting part of that too. If the life without Victor fantasy does come true, maybe Nick is going to turn cold and hard from his loss and maybe he will truly end up becoming the ruthless head of Newman Enterprises. I had kind of an, a, an interesting alternate theory or thought about Victor this week. Everybody went to the jail. It was like Victor had several visitors this week and everybody went to the jail blaming Victor for things that he really had nothing to do with. Jack goes there at the beginning of the week which I thought was fantastic. Jack is basically trying to extend the olive branch and Victor snaps it right in two saying you know what this isn't even about me whatever you're even talking about it's got nothing to do with me you got problems you need to look in your own backyard which was so true and then Adam comes to visit Victor and he's accusing Victor of having told Sage about Christian's paternity, which is also not true. Nick is, you know, having these grand moments looking at Victor's portrait on the wall and blaming him for the Newman curse and everything that's gone wrong. And everyone is truly blaming Victor for these things that he has nothing to do with. And I thought to myself, I think I finally get it. Victor is actually not meddling in their in their personal lives at this time with the exception of the brash and sassy thing which I think was really just more of kind of a plot point in order to pit Billy and Victoria and Jack and everybody against each other. Victor for the most part has really stepped back and he is truly being like you know what you guys are on your own you're not my family I don't have anything to do with you you don't want me I don't want you and in a way I thought I wonder if he's trying to show them that he is not the source of their problems all of their problems exist without him I mean it seems like they've been blaming Victor for their issues and making him the source of all of the problems for years and years honestly and now here we see that with Victor removed from the situation um, the problems are still there so I thought that was kind of kind of interesting twist now I have to talk about this Dr. Gates situation right now because she is taking such an unusual interest in Victor's life. Um, they are becoming very fast friends. She is opening up to Victor about things having to do with her father and her family. She's inserting herself and her opinion into Victor's life, which is so inappropriate 
for a prison doctor to get involved in, in an inmate's life. And Victor seems to be coming and going out of her office. And yes, she exerted a little bit of authority and gave him, he got a slap on the wrist, limited workout time for using her phone, but then she lets him right back into the door, you know, and, and, and continues to talk to him. And this week, he, I feel he was telling this kind of sob story. It's like Victor has identified what her weak spot is. I think that's what it was all about in him dragging out of her what her relationship with her father was. He found her weak spot, and he, so he starts going on about, oh, he's a fa you know, he's a father, and there's been a death in the family, and he really loves his family. She's been telling him for weeks that he really loves his family and he should forgive them, and she's been giving him all of this advice, so he knows that that's what she wants to hear. And so he starts, I think, giving her a lip service and saying, yeah, I really miss my family. I, I want their forgiveness. And so he asks her to go to Sage's memorial service on his behalf to kind of smooth things over with the family. And get this, she does it. She tries. She actually shows up at Sage's memorial service and tries to talk to Nick and Victoria and um, Summer and Adam and tries to broker like the bridge between Victor and his family. And nobody in the family other than Summer is really receptive to it. But I just thought, you fool. Oh, I had so uh, much higher hopes for her. I, I didn't think that she was going to fall for what he's doing. I think that she is genuinely a nice person. I get the vibe from Dr. Gates that she's not up to anything. I thought that maybe a couple weeks ago, but now I think she is just sort of a, a person who has her own pain, her own story, and she feels connected into Victor for one reason or another. She maybe thinks that she can help him. If she can't help her family, she can help his family. I think she's got her own reasons, good reasons for doing this. I don't know if they're co connected in a larger way. We've had some speculation about them maybe being brother and sister or him being a daughter or I mean there's a million different uh, potential ideas for a, a deeper twist connection there. But for now, I really think that she's becoming Victor's patsy. I think that basically him asking her to go to the memorial service on his behalf was a test. I think that he is testing her to see how far she's actually willing to go to help him on a personal level and she passed his test but I think she's failing <laughs> the, the the that's a good idea test for her own self in her own life. There is no doubt that Victor's getting out of jail soon and he already has his plan. Whatever it is, it hasn't entirely been revealed to us, but he's going to get out. And in fact, Marissa was back on the scene this week as well as, as Noah and she was telling Noah, I think he thinks he's going to get out and he is going, there's going to be hell to pay. I mean, he gave Marissa this mysterious message to give to Noah, which was, tell Noah all he has to do is say he's sorry and I'll forgive him. And it's a message that went to the rest of the family too. Say you're sorry and I'll forgive you. It's also pretty much the message that Dr. Gates was carrying with her little pigeoning to the family, um, say, say you're sorry and I'll forgive you. Victoria said he just wants us to kiss his ring and beg for forgiveness. Well, forget it. But when he gets out of jail, there's going to be hell to pay all around. Mm. Well, here's what I want to really talk about is Billy and Victoria and Phyllis and Jack. I, I, I tell you, I wonder if... It seemed like at the beginning of the week, Jack and Phyllis, barely Phyllis, was they were wanting to get Victoria and Billy back together. Um, one last chance. And I actually really liked, by the way, that there was a scene where Billy complies and he decides to go to Victoria and talk to her and he actually runs into Nick 
who's in the office and Nick is staring at Victor's picture and cursing it and um, there's this really nice and interesting moment between the two it was so brief where Billy acknowledges hey I know what it's like to be there standing on the side of the road not knowing what just happened to your life it was a really powerful moment it was a, a good connection to have especially considering why in our loves killing people <laughs> within car accidents on the side of this road um, but I thought I thought it was a, an interesting moment between the two guys and then Victoria walks in and she is you know very very cold of course and we're seeing Billy and Victoria snap back and forth with one another and Nick really calls them both out saying that you know I'd give anything to have another chance to be with the person that I love and you guys are just throwing it away you're you're doing it to yourselves that's what you don't see this is not about some outside force breaking apart your relationship you're doing it to yourselves and it was very insightful from from Nick as well and I think that everybody on the outside sees that Victoria and Billy actually really love each other maybe Jack just wants Billy and Victoria to get back together so that Billy is away from Phyllis. I mean, Jack has got to be seeing on some level what we're all seeing. It's it's the thing, the friendship with Billy and Phyllis was inappropriate during a lot of the stuff that they did when it came to Passkey. They had one incident where they were kissing, all right, I mean, we all knew it was coming. That should have been the clue to step back from whatever was going on right there. I feel like Billy just wants Phyllis because it's naughty. I don't feel like there's some kind of incredible fireworks connection, love of their life going on between them. I feel that it's really more about the fact that it's salacious and on Billy's part at least. For Phyllis's part, I don't I don't think Phyllis knows how to be calm and happy. If you think at it, think about it, think back on her history and her life, it's just that's never happened for her calm and happy. Everything in Phyllis's life is usually thrown up in some kind of turmoil. So calm and happy with Jack, it's just almost not her style. But yet she continues, so and I think that's probably why she's continually going back to Billy. She goes to him, which is, is so annoying. She, they encourage Billy to go get back together with Victoria, and then she's waiting at his house when he gets home with that. She's waiting at his house with a drink in her hand, and Billy has just been crushed by Victoria. She blew him off. It was not a positive experience, and so Billy goes to do the thing that Billy does, and he scoops her up, and he kisses her again and she runs away she this time she just runs away which was probably the right thing to do but why do you keep going there in the first place Phyllis why are you going there alone at night drinking alcohol when you know that that's what helped facilitate the loose lips last time why are you doing this she damn well knows what almost happened before. She was hopped up on top of her brother-in-law in front of the fire. Sex could have happened right there. They were alone at night. Sex could happen at any time. She knows what's going on here, and yet she's still drawn to it like the moth to the flame. Mm, they both are, and I just can't get out of my head that I think it's just because it's naughty. And for Billy, it annoys me to no end that he just flips back and forth between, eh, maybe I'll go get back together with Victoria. Eh, no, maybe I want to have an illicit affair with my brother-in-law's, with my brother's wife. Or, no, nah, maybe I'll want to, like, schmooze up this this incredibly beautiful buyer to for my company and he's like all of a sudden walking into the athletic club with this model looking woman on his arm and he's trying to schmooze her away from uh, 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 Jabot with his handsomeness and his charm and it's just getting to be disgusting for me like Billy pick who you want to be with have some redeeming qualities because right now you're just coming off as sleazy and I tell you um Phyllis has got to be thinking does he really want me <laughs> or am I just destroying my marriage to be another one of his flings it seems like 
it's almost, or I don't know, it's probably not over, but she does go back to talk to him about it, and it's, it's like, what do you want, Phyllis? You should just be, like, hands off and away from him. Don't ask questions. It's this weird thing where they've now kissed twice, and they don't really talk about what's gone on. It is so just in the air, in the room between them, which I suppose would be hot if, the, if it weren't for the, if Jack didn't exist, if Jack didn't exist, and if it didn't feel like Billy just wanted to get some from somebody. The interesting thing I will say is the Fiona thing. She's, I guess, like some kind of cosmetics buyer who can make sure that your products get on the shelf with premium placement. And she's been working with Jabot, but now that Billy is the owner of Brash and Sassy, she's Billy's trying to woo her to try to work for him. And he, I mean, he, he sealed the whole deal with a kiss too. Billy's lips are getting a lot of action right now, and that doesn't exactly endear me to him. But the interesting thing that I didn't really think about was the fact that Billy buying Brash and Sassy puts him into direct competition with Jabot and with Jack, which is really kind of a great twist. I saw it as a way to get back at Victoria last week, but now I'm like, oh, this is actually kind of good for furthering the rivalry between the two brothers as if the relationship, his inappropriate relationship with Phyllis is not enough. And Jack blows up, of course, when he sees what Billy is doing. It's just more and more like crumbling of their relationship. And Jack actually did at the very end of, I think, Friday's show, lay into Phyllis a little bit. He was blaming her and he actually like talked more openly about the fact that she fueled his fire, that she encouraged him and had him do everything with passkey and that it just fed his ego and now look at where we are. And I did appreciate though that Phyllis jumped back at Jack and said, wait a minute, you're not gonna blame this on me. You're the one that punished him. You're the one that exiled him to Hong Kong all those years ago, which I thought was great. I mean, you know, it's it's there's nobody here that's really blameless. Billy has been treated sort of like the second class Abbott for a while. So it's like all sides are, I think, pretty appropriately represented here, which makes it a really good story. Um, the, the thing at the end of the week that was kind of a letdown, though, was after this fight with Jack, of course, Phyllis goes right to Billy. That's what she does, where she should just stay away from Billy, don't have any more contact, don't go to his house anymore. She can't stop herself. She goes to Billy and I don't, there's just like this thing between them where he, he is smug with her and she gives him this kind of weak slap. It was the weakest slap. It was quite clear that she did not mean it at all. I thought that was so lame. But then Fiona comes out and she's riding the motorcycle with him as if Billy's trying to flaunt the fact that Phyllis has been replaced. Oh, well, if you're not going to ride my motorcycle, as if that's not a euphemism, if you're not going to jump on my motorcycle and ride it, Phyllis, then I'm going to have Fiona here do it. And oh yeah, guess what? She's a beautiful model. Um, and, and Phyllis is just, I think, mortified. I cannot imagine all of the things that are going on in her head. I would have slapped him harder just cause, or I would have liked to see a harder slap just cause. I'm wondering if Fiona is just there as kind of uh, eye candy kind of thing to make Billy or to make Phyllis jealous, or she did overhear and pick up on the fact that something more was going on between Billy and Phyllis. Is there any chance that Fiona's gonna run back and tell Jack? Wouldn't it be grand if Hillary actually did go on 60 Minutes? <laughs> They're both CBS shows. I would, and I like 60 Minutes, I'd die. I would die if there was a crossover. Mm, probably not. 60 Minutes is kind of a serious news program, but <laughs> I like the idea of Hillary being interviewed by Morley Schaefer. <laughs> that would be hilarious. So she's been offered 
on behalf of 60 Minutes to do an interview regarding the research project. And Ashley is like, oh hell no you're not. You, she, please, you are not doing that interview. And furthermore, you better start watching your step, which I really liked. I thought that was fun. I love Hillary uh, versus Ashley. I loved the little cattiness that was happening in the lab uh, where Hillary, Hillary told Abby, like you are not as strong as you think you are. It was so unnecessarily witchy um but after going to and talking to ashley and everything she goes to neil and she says hey if i'm gonna be on 60 minutes maybe i'll talk about the abbott winters foundation as well and neil's like no you're not we don't need your kind of publicity and she yet again says um, if you don't do what I want, I'm going to blackmail you. Do you want to really be exposed as the man who kidnapped me? Well, guess who's standing off in the corner when she says that? Kane. Kane immediately is like, I'm sorry, what? Did, did she just say that you are the one who actually kidnapped her? Which is so appropriate, too, because Kane got blamed for that for a while. I mean, the, didn't they find a gym bag or there was something in Kane's gym bag or something. Kane, it caused problems in his relationship. That whole thing with Hillary and people accusing him and thinking he had something to do with the money. Or, or yeah, they thought he was trying to extort money from Devon. So the fact that Kane finally overheard that was, I think, very appropriate. And it was about darn time. And we saw from the previews of next week's show that Kane and Neil are going to have a private talk about this where Kane says, oh, don't worry. I'm not going to tell the world. There's only one person that I'm going to tell. Ooh, what is Lily going to say? I'm sure Neil's going to beg him not to do it. Will he actually go through with that? Do you think Kane will actually tell Lily? Wow. I think that's really good. Um, I do want to follow up on something we talked about a little bit last week. It seems like at this point, Hillary's only supporter in all of Genoa City is poor old Jack. And we just touched on last week the fact that, hmm, is there gonna be some kind of relationship going on between Hillary and Jack? And I wish I would have said this then. I immediately, as soon as I was done recording, regretted that I didn't really dig into this. But I, I kind of am thinking that Hillary is not gonna have a relationship with Jack that is so much romantic. I think Hillary may smell blood in the water and that is giving her a reason to connect in with Jack. Maybe that's why she was bonding with him at the bar last week. Maybe, and we may see even more of that next week. I think Hillary knows what she wants and she darn well knows how to push a man off the wagon. She did it to Neil. Remember, Neil was clean and sober for a long stretch of years before Hillary started putting vodka into his drink and she could very well start doing that to Jack again. I mean, Ashley was going on this week about the Abbott power. Like, you know, you've got Devon's money, but the Abbots have clout. So don't even think of messing with me. So the thing is, Hillary has money and power by being married to Devon. I think what Hillary wants is the company. And with Jack out of the way, she could take over Jabot, stick it to the Abbots and Ashley and everyone who ever doubted her. Poor little Charlie does not know who he is playing checkers with. Oh man, that kid is messed up. Max is messed up. He catches on to the fact that Dylan has requested the surveillance tapes from the athletic club on the day that Abby fell down the stairs. And so what does he do? He manipulates Charlie into stealing the master key card to get into the server room. And the little Dickens sets it on freaking fire. That kid needs help bad. And the thing about it, it's not even just, it's, it's honest to God, not even just so much that he tripped Abby and, and she fell downstairs. It's not so much that he started the fire. The thing that really gets me about this kid that is really, really twisted is he has this way of making himself the victim and saying, you didn't believe me. And, and it's just the way he's done it is so masterful. 
and it has caused such an incredible wedge between Stitch and Abby, which thinking about it, I really think what he wanted all along was to get rid of Abby so that he could hook up Ashley and Stitch, and who knows if that's gonna end up happening eventually, because Ashley and Stitch are broken. She has no choice but to talk, to not only now say that she believes Max caused her to trip down the stairs, but that he's the one that caused the fire. It was Abby that was saying immediately, like, I mean, seriously, this, this suit, as soon as it comes up that that server room was destroyed in a fire, Abby knew right away. She calls Dylan and she says, this is not right. I smell a rat. You need to investigate it. Dylan does. I mean, he had to go get a DNA sample and fingerprints from Max as soon as he realized that it, the fire was set deliberately. It was so, so hard to watch Abby knowing that she was right. It was hard to watch Stitch knowing that he was being manipulated. And it's hard to watch this little Max playing the victim when we know as the audience what he did. It is so, so twisted. I kept thinking, oh, they should have Paul on this case. Paul knows what it's like to have a bad seed son. He died right there in that hotel, Ricky. It's, it's an interesting story though. I'm not gonna lie. I mean, even though it's like, this is messed up. It is, a, it is I can't, take my eyes off of it. I'm very interested to see where it's going to go because at Stitch, he is just wanting to believe his son, but the fingerprint doesn't lie. Dylan comes back to Stitch and says, I'm sorry, man. Like we found Max's fingerprints in the room. He did it. We have hard evidence. Charlie ended up confessing that he gave the key card to Max and Stitch is now in this position of realizing probably, I mean, on both ends realizing that uh, my son did something horrible. My wife was right and I didn't believe her. And the second like St St Stitch turns to go get the kid and, and, and realize that something's gonna have to happen, he's gone. Max is just gone. He flees, he realizes that he's caught, flees out of the hotel room. Who knows where he is now? I'm shocked, I really thought that Max was gonna be smart enough to make Charlie do it or to not leave his fingerprints or something. I'm shocked that they actually found out that it was him. I'm glad, of course, but now where is he? Look out, Genoa City, lock your doors, bolt your windows, there is a psycho kid on the loose. Someone's trying to steal my baby. <laughs> that was last week's Who Said It quote. It was so tongue in cheek and fabulous because it was Victoria who said it. As all of this craziness is going down with the baby swap, it's it, it, it just was such an interesting little play on the scene that uh, Victoria would say, someone's trying to steal my baby, only she was referring to Brash and Sassy as she found out that it was going to be sold out from under her. So a lot of people got that one right. I think everybody who guessed that got that one right. It was such a fun moment. I suppose it was pretty easy. Michelle, Connor, Tina Cole, Nancy, Ryan, Sharita, Adam, Victoria, Lauren, Robbie. Oh, I gotta get this. <laughs> Zuperxplex? Zoperex Plex. I hope I got that right. <laughs> Maybe you could phonetically spell that one for me. Henry, Sean, Gina, Sonia, Robin, Beatrice, Gary, Justin, Jamie, Nicole, Dylan, Erica, Consuela, Jen, Colleen, Astra, Tanya, and Aaron all got it right. I think that's a record <laughs> for the number of people who got it right. Woo, I'm out of breath now. <laughs> I probably I, I probably could have made that one a little harder, but I think this I think this week's might be a little bit more challenging because it's one of those, well, anybody could have said it. So this week's Who Said It quote is honesty is the best policy. 
I think it's a good quote because it's pretty well ironic coming from anyone in Genoa City. Is there anyone in Genoa City who actually practices honesty is the best policy? I don't think so. <laughs> but one of these hypocritical characters said it this week. And if you think you know who it was, and if you leave your comment on the website at yrchat.com, and if you get it right, <laughs> then I will give you your shout out during next week's chat. Okay, let's get to these YNR Chatter comments. Sandra at yrchat.com commented, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main, and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Sandra says, oh, I'm dying watching YNR this week. Such good acting. Nick's face just staring into space while Victoria bandages his hand. Adam, heartbroken, laying flowers at the crash site. The theme song playing whilst Victor reads a quote from John John. It, it, it was so good, Sandra. I'm so glad that you posted that quote. Um, it was a very powerful show. They ended did the show with uh, the the theme song it was just it was beautiful it was a it was it was beautifully done and haunting um, it was so many emotions it, it, it I I wish Sage wouldn't have died but darn it I think that that was a good moment for Victor it was a good moment for all of the characters we got some juice out of that and I'm, I'm really glad you posted that quote um, Gary left me a voicemail regarding Dr. Gates that really helped me, I think, form my outlook on her this week. Gary mentioned that a couple years ago, there was this prison break in upstate New York where there was a woman who ended up helping two prisoners escape from this maximum security prison, and she ended up like smuggling in a hacksaw in the froze into a, a pound of frozen meat and she gave it to the guy and helped them get out and it I was so like it just dawned on me when Gary mentioned that incident it was a few years ago but I totally heard about it watched a Dateline episode on it thought it was fascinating and Gary was connecting it in with Dr. Gates and I thought Oh my gosh, that is it. It's almost like she's getting wrapped up into something that she doesn't mean to because this woman who helped the prisoners escape, she I think she just got in over her head. I think there was a romantic relationship that developed between her and one of the one of the people who ended up breaking out and they used it. That you know him and, and his buddy ended up kind of using it and preying on the fact that she was maybe not happy in her marriage and she she was maybe just not all that bright. Uh, she just got manipulated into helping these two guys break out of prison. She was a prison worker. And I thought, well, that is genius, Gary, because that may very well be what ends up working in Victor's favor. I don't know that Dr. Gates is going to physically help him break out, but I think that she is being used to help maybe Get, talk to the warden who is her father, or not the warden, talk to the head of the parole board, the guy who's who, her father. I think that she's being manipulated by Victor to help get him out of prison. And it's something that Victor and Ian talked about last week or the week before. And it just clicked with me. That helped make her motivation makes sense. I don't know if she's going to end up being a long-term character on the show or not, but I really, really think now that that's what her function is. I love that. Connor left me a voicemail saying, well, call me crazy, but when Sharon had that DNA test done, don't the DNA tests prove who the mother and father are? I believe that Sharon knows Adam is the father. Whoa, that never even occurred to me. And Consuela left a comment at yrchat.com saying, does Sharon suspect something of Adam? 
It seems like she's been singling him out these past couple of episodes. First, she made a big deal to Chelsea about how close Adam and Sage were, and then second, she tells Adam that he should say something at Sage's memorial, putting Adam on the spot immediately, like she had an ulterior motive. Oh my gosh, Connor and Consuela, I never would have thought of that in a million years. But maybe Sharon does suspect it. Could that play into the reason why she just wants to keep her mouth shut about everything that she's learned with Christian? Maybe she realizes that if she tells the truth, Adam's going to tell his part of the truth, and both Dylan and Nick are going to lose the baby, and it's just going to rock the whole world even more. Is that how Sharon is ultimately going to be redeemed from all of this? Or is that somehow going to give us more of an insight into her motive aside from just lies and probably selfishness. Ooh. Um, Sean on YouTube left a comment regarding uh, why Adam didn't come forward about the paternity in the first place because I've been talking about that and commenting on it the past two weeks. I've just mentioned that it baffles me that Adam would not claim his son but Sean says I think that Adam at the time was known as Gabriel and having him be exposed as Adam would create an abundant amount of chaos because I remember vividly that Sage didn't want Adam to be the father. That's why he switched the test so that Nick could be the dad so Sage could be happy. Plus, Adam was also afraid that him being the father of Christian might draw a wedge between him and Chelsea. As Victor would say, he did it for his family. Yes, I think you're right, Sean. I definitely think that was Adam's thinking behind not uh, revealing the paternity thing. I think it's not so much that I don't understand Adam's motivation. It's just more that I would have expected his desire to claim his son to weigh more and be more, even more than having his identity exposed, even more than causing a rift in he and Chelsea's relationship. It just seems like because Adam is so in the name of the family and he's so much like Victor, especially when it comes to his children, I just guess I would have expected him to not step back and let another man raise his child. I just, I understand all of the elements at play. I just really thought that that paternal instinct would have weighed heavier. Um, and I just would have completely expected his character to have, to have come forward about that. Um, Daisy on Facebook says, Adam doesn't know that Christian is alive. So I think it's easy for him to keep the truth from Nick. But once the truth comes out that Sully is Christian, I think Adam will have a change of heart and want his son. With Sage gone, I don't see any reason why Adam would be okay with Nick raising his son. Which is, it, it, that is also a good point. I mean, it may also be that Adam was trying to do this for Sage, and, and I'm sure that that is, was part of his motivation, that you know this was Sage's wishes. I just would have expected him to be more selfish and come out with it uh, sooner, but I think Daisy's right that as soon as he finds out that piece of the puzzle, I don't, I don't think he's there, he has any continuing motivation to to keep that a secret. Uh, I think that the, my problem too is that the fight over Christian's paternity would have been so much more interesting if Sage were still alive because it would have ramifications for Chelsea and Adam too. It feels like now Chelsea and Adam are just going to ultimately end up raising Christian together and that's kind of meh. It's not that exciting. I think it would have been so much more exciting if the truth came out about the paternity and Sage was forced into their lives and it really truly seemed like that was one of those arcs that YNR was building toward. It seemed really truly like YNR was building toward an a a Sage and Adam relationship that might cause some problems and some breaks in the foundation for Adam and Chelsea and it just seems like it got thrown by the wayside when they decided to kill her. Justin left me a voicemail saying, I am very disgusted with Sharon right now. Sharon knows what it's like to have a child taken away from her. Remember when Sharon, uh, or sorry, when Adam took Faith and gave her to Ashley? Sharon knows that pain, yet she's keeping this secret. I guess I kind of even forgot to about, or I mean, I think I remembered it at the time, but yeah, that baby switch that Adam pulled on, <laughs> on Faith and Sharon and Ashley, and yeah, as Sharon was a victim of that, and yet she is willingly and knowingly allowing either 
Nick or Adam. Whether she knows who the father is or not, she's still allowing the lie to go on. Oh, Anna left a voicemail <laughs> and she said, I am impressed with the actress who plays Faith. She had tears and everything at the memorial. She put some of the adult actresses there to shame. She did give a nice little performance. Um, I liked what she said about Sage and they had, she made, Sage and her were playing and Faith made some kind of mess on the floor and Sage said, it's okay, it's just a, a happy accident. And that's what she called her family. Uh, or no, a happy mess. It was a happy mess, and that's what she called her family. I thought that was a, a nice little line, and it was nicely delivered. Uh, Beatrice left me a voicemail saying, Finally, now Max can get some psychiatric help, and then Ben needs to apologize to Abby. Do you think that even when um, Ben apologizes to Abby, which assume, assuming he will, is their relationship beyond repair at this point? The trust seems to be broken between them. Stitch wouldn't even acknowledge the possibility that Max could have done this. He most definitely took Max's side immediately, and I wonder if that is something that really can't be forgiven by her. Uh, Jamie left me a voicemail saying, Evil Max is a train wreck, but also kind of fascinating to watch. Is it possible they're gonna link him to his mother's death? Yes, I think I think it's very possible. We talked about this maybe two or three weeks ago when it was first kind of um, coming out clear that the kid was straight up psycho. I, I really wouldn't be surprised. I wonder if this is going to lead to Stitch investigating a little bit more and maybe finding out if something uh, happened. I mean, I don't know what his motive would be for killing his mom other than if he wanted to go live with his dad. I'm not sure. Is there any chance at this point that Stitch is in danger? If Max would kill his mom, if Max would do what he did to Abby, and I think Abby mentioned this this week, is there any chance that Stitch is next on the chopping block? Ellen at YRChat.com says, Luca is a total snake in the grass. He is playing Summer like a violin. He's always telling her how smart she is based on absolutely nothing. Summer has no education and no work experience to speak of. Luca just wants to marry a Newman. Yeah, I like, I, 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 that's the thing that bugs me is the way that it feels like Luca's always pumping her up. And then we know that he's working behind the scenes on his own agenda. That's what makes me doubt the relationship. And I think we're all kind of in that camp now, right? Uh, Aaron on YouTube says, I do appreciate how Hillary is threatening Neil. For months, Neil used Hillary for sex and claiming how much he loves her, even though he held her captive at the boathouse for months. While Devon was being blamed for her faked murder, Neil stood back and did nothing to stop it. So I'm enjoying Hillary finally using Neil's crimes to blackmail him. Hillary is owed revenge from that. <laughs> I, I have been wanting to see this blow up in Neil's face, but I, I think it'll be good if it doesn't blow up in this very public way. I like the idea of it just blowing up within the family and causing some, some problems there with Lily uh, and uh, Kane and her dad. Gina left me a voicemail saying, the storyline with Billy and Phyllis is taking me back 25 years. Remember when Jack and Jill had their affair? It's like deja vu. Maybe this is Jack getting his karma. Ooh, and I'll add to that too, Gina, that Phyllis was always so hurt when Nick was bouncing back and forth between she and Sharon, and now she's doing it to Jack. So nobody's really learned from the destructiveness of their various affairs. Um, Sandra at YRChat.com also had uh, kind of tipped me off, and I think Gary mentioned this too, that Jessica Collins one uh, at the Daytime Emmys for Outstanding Supporting Actress, which is so fantastic. I thought she was great. I did went, I did go and look at who the winners were, and there was not a whole lot acting-wise for YNR. I think they won Best Hair and Makeup and a couple other things that I can't remember, but not a lot of the actors won. I think only Jessica Collins, uh, but that was so, so great to see. I do really like her. I wouldn't mind if YNR brought her back, darn it. 
who knows? You never know. Oh, I also had to say uh, Mary Ann left a comment at yrchat.com saying um, that since I just got my new digital subscription to the magazine, there was no mention of Kelly Sullivan under comings and goings because I was asking last week that you know if anybody heard this was this in any of the magazines and Marianne says no uh, it was kept under wraps better than usual she also says that she subscribed to the digital version of Soap Opera Digest with Zinio I've never heard of that uh, for less than 50 cents an issue and that Amazon also has a Kindle version for about $20 a year. I gotta get that, man. I gotta get me on my magazines. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I always say it. It's ridiculous that I sit here in my in our chat and don't have the magazines. I think I like the actual magazine though. I want I want to look at the pictures. I want to flip through them. I'm, I never go to the... By the time they're on the newsstands, it's old news. I like getting my subscription so that I can get ahead of it, of the, of the that what's going on even just a couple of days but I remember even back in the day there used to be a, a, a nothing it, soap operas are just not what they used to be in their heyday do you remember like the soap opera weekly there used to be a giant soap opera weekly magazine I mean this thing was like bigger than a regular eight and a half by eleven magazine it was gigantic and it was stuffed full of all the soap opera news for the week um but i always liked soap opera digest and the soaps in depth ones most of the soaps in depth ones though just because i only like the cbs soaps i don't really want to hear about days in general hospital i just i don't know i don't watch them so i want i want my concentrated cbs shows but I should get a soap opera digest, but then I've got you guys to tell me all about it too. Yeah, who needs soap opera magazines when I have a whole bunch of YNR chatters giving me all the best opinions and all the best scoop. It's like my very own curated soap opera magazine. <laughs> oh, so those are the comments from last week. What are the comments this week? I know you guys have got some, so here's what you can do if you want to leave them. You can go to yrchat.com. From there, there's tons of space on the blog to leave anything you want to say, as well as chat with each other. I really like it when you guys interact with each other. That makes me feel good. Um, but if you don't want to leave it on the blog, you can also go to Facebook and YouTube. You can call into my voicemail at 309 588 four five six nine and leave all of your comments however you would like to I read and love every single one so thank you very much and we'll come back next week we'll read some more comments we'll talk some more about the show and I'll see you then bye